Ever wondered why a book with all the answers about the universe's origins was banned for over 2,000 years? The Book of Enoch remains one of history's most controversial texts. Who was this man so righteous that God spared him from death? Why did his story provoke such fear and secrecy? What knowledge made this book so dangerous? It's the second and third centuries, and the early Christian church is just starting to take shape. People are buzzing about a mysterious and intriguing book called the Book of Enoch. This book is so popular that it's mentioned by several key church fathers of the time, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Oregon, and Clement of Alexandria are some of the big names who talked about the Book of Enoch. Even the Epistle of Barnabas from the early 2nd century draws heavily from it. Just imagine reading something that influential. Now, let's talk about Tertullian, an ancient Roman philosopher who went as far as to call the Book of Enoch Holy Scripture. For the first 300 years after Christ, people knew about this book, read it, and respected it, it was a big deal, extremely popular back then. This book was everywhere, and people couldn't get enough of its mysterious content. But then something happened. The Council of Laodicea came along and decided that the Book of Enoch was too controversial. They deemed it wrong and basically put it on the blacklist of religious texts. Imagine being told that your favorite book series was suddenly banned. That's what happened to the followers of the Book of Enoch. The church leaders at the time thought that the content of the Book of Enoch was too risky, too out there. It challenged some of the established ideas and beliefs, and they couldn't have that. As a result, the Book of Enoch lost its credibility and was banned, a ban that remains in effect even today. This book, once held in high regard and read widely, was systematically erased from religious practice. Your Bible doesn't include the Book of Enoch. That's how powerful and thorough the ban was. With the ban, people stopped reading and discussing it. Slowly, the Book of Enoch vanished from sight, forgotten by many. Its powerful stories and lessons were buried in history, hardly ever mentioned. This shows how much control the early church leaders had, shaping what people believed for centuries. The book got lost in the seas of time and was hardly spoken of until the 1400s. Around the time of the Protestant Reformation, interest in the Book of Enoch was resurrected. By the late 1400s, whispers spread that the long-lost book might still exist. But beware, some took advantage of people's thirst for truth and released forgeries claiming to be the lost Book of Enoch. That happened until a Scottish explorer named James Bruce stumbled upon the original Book of Enoch in Ethiopia he discovered the ancient manuscript among the sacred texts of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Fortunately, despite not being part of the Bible's canon, the Church had preserved this valuable text. The text James Bruce discovered is inscribed in Gaez, an ancient Semitic language exclusive to the Ethiopian region. This language, with its roots stretching back to the dawn of civilization, was spoken and written by the people of Ethiopia during ancient times. Scholars believe that the manuscript dates back to a period between the 3rd and 1st centuries BC. The text James found comprises five distinct parts, each shedding light on various aspects of Enoch's life. From his encounters with the Watchers to his celestial journeys to heaven and even his visions of the end of the world, each section offers a unique glimpse into the extraordinary experiences of this mysterious figure. James Bruce returned with three copies of the Lost Book of Enoch, originally inscribed in Ethiopian script. Richard Lawrence undertook the task of translating it into English, unveiling its mysteries to the world in 1821. Later, in 1912, the renowned R. H. Charles version captivated readers with its profound insights and revelations. Twenty-eight years later, additional versions of the book were discovered in a cave famously known as Cave 4, unveiling more captivating stories. The Book of Enoch is believed to be one of the earliest written accounts by humans and possibly served as inspiration for the Book of Genesis and the Bible, including both the New and Old Testaments. This really shows the immense age of the Book of Enoch and its profound impact on biblical history. 
It said that some apostles of the Bible quoted Enoch while preaching. One notable direct quote in the New Testament comes from Jude in Jude 1, 14 to 15, where he references Enoch 1, 9. In this passage, Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied saying, Behold, the Lord came with his holy myriads to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners spoke against him. So it's evident that the author, Jude, was familiar with the teachings of Enoch and held them in high regard. He respected the verse enough to include it in his writing, showcasing the influence and significance of Enoch's words even within the Bible itself. In another interesting comparison, we can look at Genesis 6, 1 and Enoch 6, 1. Genesis talks about how humanity began to grow on earth, with daughters being born to them. The angels, seeing these daughters, found them attractive and chose them as wives, leading to the birth of children. Similarly, in Enoch, it describes how the sons of heaven also desired the daughters of men, deciding to take them as wives and have children. This similarity between the two texts highlights common themes and beliefs about the interaction between humans and celestial beings in ancient narratives. Well, many people believe that the Book of Enoch reveals a lot of hidden secrets that have been kept under wraps for centuries, shedding light on mysteries that have been unknown for a long time. The Book of Enoch gives a lot of details about events that Genesis 1-6 only briefly mentions. It talks about Enoch's journeys to hidden places on earth and in heaven. These include places like Sheol, which is the Jewish afterlife, the abyss, the holy mountains, the ten heavens, the gates of heaven, and where the angels live. Now let's talk about the ten heavens. The book of Enoch talks about ten levels of heaven. Enoch was escorted to each level by an archangel, where he saw the different beings dwelling in each realm. Some of the powerful beings in the higher heavens frightened Enoch so much that he was overcome with terror and fell down. The beginning of 2 Enoch recounts the story of a wise man and a great artisan whom the Lord took away because of his love for him. This man, Enoch, was chosen to witness the highest realms of the kingdom of God Almighty, experiencing the most wise, great, inconceivable, and unchanging aspects. He beheld the marvelous, glorious, shining and many-eyed station of the Lord's servants, the immovable throne of the Lord, the organized ranks of angelic armies, and the indescribable composition of the multitude of elements. Enoch became an eyewitness to the army of the cherubim and the immeasurable light. This shows how the Lord esteemed Enoch so highly that he brought him to heaven while he was still alive, a privilege shared only by the prophet Elijah. As we keep reading the book of Enoch, Enoch himself tells us about meeting the angels who took him to heaven. It all started with a dream he had where he saw these angels coming into his room, but when he woke up, they were actually there right in front of him. Feeling really troubled, Enoch found himself crying in his sleep, not understanding why he felt so upset or what was going on. Then two huge men appeared before him, unlike anything he had ever seen on earth. Their faces radiated like the sun, their eyes blazed like fiery lamps, and flames seemed to flicker from their mouths. Their garments displayed various colors, and their wings shimmered more brilliantly than gold. Their hands gleamed whiter than snow. Standing at the head of his bed, they called him by name. When he woke up, he saw them right there, and he got really scared. Bowing down before them, he trembled with terror. Yet the men reassured him urging him to be brave, for the eternal God had sent them to escort him to heaven. Enoch found himself being lifted up to the first heaven by these winged beings. As they ascended, he noticed the clouds drifting and the air growing thinner. Eventually, he reached the ether, feeling a sense of wonder. Placed upon the first heaven, he marveled at the vast ocean, far grander than any he had seen on earth. Amidst this spectacle, he encountered mysterious figures known as the Elders and witnessed 200 angels overseeing the stars. In the second heaven, Enoch saw something like a really dark place, almost scarier than anything he'd ever seen on earth. He noticed some folks there who seemed to be prisoners, 
just waiting for some kind of judgment. So Enoch asked one of the angels why these people were going through all this suffering. The angel explained that they had turned away from the Lord, ignoring his rules, and instead chose to follow their own ideas, even teaming up with a leader who had also rebelled against God. The third heaven, as described by Enoch, is a realm of unparalleled beauty and tranquility reserved for those who lived righteous lives. It's like stepping into a breathtaking garden with trees bursting with vibrant flowers and fruits that emit the most heavenly fragrances. At the heart of this paradise stands the majestic Tree of Life, a sight so wondrous it defies description, its branches stretching towards the sky with an ethereal glow. Surrounding this tree are streams, not just of water, but of honey, milk, oil, and wine, symbolizing abundance and purity. These streams flow gently through the landscape, nourishing every living thing they touch. Guarding this heavenly abode are 300 radiant angels, their voices blending in harmonious worship of the divine. Their songs resonate throughout the heavens, filling the air with a sense of peace and serenity. And who are the chosen ones to dwell in this celestial realm? They are righteous, those who endured trials, showed kindness to others, and remained steadfast in their faith. For them, this paradise awaits as an eternal inheritance, a reward for a life well lived in accordance with God's will. Enoch's journey continued as he was led to the northern region of the third heaven, a place he described as truly terrifying. Here, amidst the darkness, he encountered a scene that seemed reminiscent of hell itself. The air was thick with an eerie black fire, casting shadows that danced in a macabre display. As Enoch ventured further, he came upon a river of fire, a sight that brought to mind the biblical depiction of hell as a lake of fire. The angels accompanying him explained that this place was reserved for those who had turned away from God, indulging in wickedness and sin. Verse 10 delves deeper into the characteristics of those destined for this realm, a list that includes practitioners of witchcraft, thieves, liars, and those who exploit and oppress the vulnerable. These people, who cared only for themselves and hurt others, will end up in this lonely place forever. It's what they deserve for breaking the rules set by God. Enoch was then guided to the fourth heaven, where he witnessed the paths of the sun and moon. He saw how the sun's light was much brighter than the moon's, and he observed the sun's constant movement, like a wheel spinning rapidly. Around the sun's chariot were four great stars on each side, with thousands of stars beneath them. Enoch marveled at the spectacle of 8,000 stars accompanying the sun, with 150,000 angels escorting it by day and 1,000 angels by night, their wings blazing with fire. In the fifth heaven, also known as the Watcher's Domain, Enoch encountered the Grigori, who resembled humans but were gigantic. These angels, often associated with the Nephilim, were believed to have offspring with human women. In the sixth heaven, there are seven distinct groups of angels, described as radiant beings even brighter than the sun. Their tasks, as outlined in 2 Enoch verse 19, involve carefully observing the movements of stars, the sun's revolution, the moon's phases, and the overall harmony of the cosmos. Whenever they detect any wrongdoing, they ensure that divine commandments are upheld, accompanied by beautiful melodies of praise, these are the archangels who hold authority over the other angels. Enoch got really scared in the seventh heaven. He saw the fiery armies of the archangels and other powerful beings like cherubim and seraphim. The sight was so overwhelming that Enoch was left shaking. Then the two men who were with him left, and Enoch fell down, terrified. To help him, God sent Archangel Gabriel, one of his special angels. The eighth heaven is called Musaloth in Hebrew. It's where the seasons change from dry to wet and vice versa. It also houses the 12 zodiac signs located above the seventh heaven. In the ninth heaven, which is called Kukavim in Hebrew, he observed the celestial abodes of the 12 zodiac signs. In the tenth and final heaven where God resides, Enoch describes God's face as resembling iron heated in a blazing fire, emitting sparks and evoking immense awe and fear. Cherubim and angelic armies sing in this divine realm. 
Overwhelmed by fear, God orders Archangel Michael to remove Enoch's earthly garments and anoint him with a spiritual oil glowing with light. Upon seeing himself, Enoch realizes he is no different from the angels in heaven. The Book of Enoch is considered so profound because it's believed to document humanity's earliest encounters with beings from beyond Earth, commonly referred to as aliens. These beings, known as the Watchers, which we mentioned during our journey through the Ten Heavens, are described as non-human entities who descended from the sky and interacted with humans. Enoch recounts his encounter with them, describing them as towering figures with faces shining like the sun, adorned in beautiful clothing, and possessing captivating voices. Researchers like Eric von Daniken, a Swiss author known for his books proposing extraterrestrial influences on ancient human civilizations, suggest that the beings described by Enoch might indeed be extraterrestrial, commonly referred to as aliens. Another fascinating detail in Enoch's description is the mode of transportation employed by the Watchers. They are depicted as traveling in chariots of fire, with wheels spinning so rapidly that they appear to be engulfed in flames. The chariots make a thunderous sound as they zoom by at incredible speed. These descriptions sound a lot like what people say about UFOs today. Many people have shared stories of spotting strange flying machines that zip around at high speeds and produce thunderous sounds, just like Enoch described. These individuals aren't necessarily Christians or strong believers. Also, a lot of Christians don't even know about the Book of Enoch. So when they talk about seeing strange things, it's worth listening to. It's also fascinating to think that the Sumerians, way back in ancient Mesopotamia, might have been the first to write down stories about extraterrestrial visitors. You see, they weren't just early writers. Some say they were the first astronomers too. The Sumerians' mythology recounts how gods, which could be interpreted as alien beings, descended from the sky to share knowledge, much like the accounts in the Book of Watchers. It could also clarify why ancient civilizations managed to align their massive structures with the stars in various regions of the globe. The Sumerians refer to these extraterrestrial beings as Anunnaki. In Enoch's accounts and other ancient texts, they were described as creatures from another world, towering in size and often referred to as luminous beings. According to an old Egyptian record, Enoch might have helped build the Great Pyramids. This hints that the wisdom shared by the Watchers might have come from contact with a highly advanced alien civilization, similar to what the Sumerians believed. These beings were said to have taught humanity a wide range of things, from weaponry to astrology, including knowledge about constellations, clouds, the sun, and the moon's movements. Essentially, they were believed to be responsible for humanity's advancement. You might wonder about the consequences and what's wrong with such actions. Consider this. Imagine giving a Ferrari to a child. Naturally, they wouldn't know how to handle it properly, and they could end up causing a lot of damage to themselves and others. Humanity, compared to the child, didn't handle the knowledge well. They misused it, which led to corruption and pride, causing problems and conflicts. Now, while some still think Enoch met aliens, most Bible scholars and those who followed the Bible believe Enoch encountered angels. These beings, known as the Watchers, were angels whose main duty was to watch over humans. That's probably why they got the name The Watchers, their main task was to avoid any interactions with humans at all, but that's where they went wrong and disobeyed God. The Watchers didn't just mingle with humans, they even left heaven to satisfy their desire for women, all because their leader, Samyaza, persuaded them to. The Witchers ended up marrying and having children with human women, leading to the birth of a unique lineage called the Nephilim. These Nephilim were half angel, half human, and notably gigantic in size. The Nephilim were monstrous beings possessing immense physical strength that they often used for destructive purposes. They were known for causing widespread damage through their actions, primarily focused on stealing and consuming. And when the earth could no longer sustain them, the Nephilim turned to attacking animals and eventually even humans for sustenance. 
This might be the origin of the Cyclops in Greek mythology. In fact, according to the story told in the Theogony by the Greek epic poet Hesiod, the Cyclops were the sons of Uranus, the sky god, and Gaia, the earth goddess. This loosely resembles the union between the Watchers, representing Uranus, and the women, representing Gaia. The Nephilim's presence disrupted Earth's natural order, leading to constant conflict. In 1 Enoch 69, 4-12, we can find a list of the names and misdeeds of some of the fallen angels, often referred to as the Five Satans. They were namely Yakon, Asbiel, Gadriel, Penemu, Kasdasia. Each of these fallen angels' actions had devastating consequences. Yakon led the other angels to come down to earth and take human wives. This act of disobedience initiated the corruption among humans. Asbiel gave the counsel to the holy sons of God, leading them to commit the sin of coming down to earth and defiling themselves with human women. Gadriel is credited with misleading Eve in the Garden of Eden. He also taught humans the art of warfare, including making weapons and shields. Penemu taught humans the secrets of wisdom. Specifically, he instructed them on the use of ink and paper, thereby spreading falsehoods and leading them into sins. And Kasdasia, he taught humans about wicked practices such as smiting spirits and demons, incantations, and the art of abortion. A great reset was needed, aka the Flood. The Flood served as the ultimate punishment for the Nephilim, who were considered abominable and responsible for widespread sin and depravity. Their presence corrupted the world beyond repair, necessitating a reset to restore order and righteousness. The Flood was humanity's last resort. There's evidence, like giant skeletons discovered worldwide, indicating the existence of a colossal race. The Book of Enoch has all it takes to last through the ages, with its clear explanations of Enoch's experiences, quotes from important people throughout history, and its use before being banned. Yet it's still surrounded by mystery and controversy. One big question is why the book was banned and removed from the Bible in the first place. The Book of Enoch was a big deal in the past. Lots of people read it back in ancient times. So what made the higher-ups say no to the Book of Enoch? Even today, only the Ethiopian and Eritrean Orthodox churches consider it a holy book. Two reasons stand out for the ban. First, most of the books attributed to Enoch weren't actually written by him. Surprising, right? They were likely penned at different times and by different authors, with some sections possibly dating as far back as 300 BC. So everything, and we mean everything we've been talking about, might just be a bedtime story after all. That's the thing with legends. They often blur the line between fact and fiction, leaving us to wonder what's real and what's just a good yarn. These writings are known as pseudoepigrapha. They're ancient texts that falsely claim to be written by a character from the Bible. This type of writing was pretty common in the ancient world, especially between 200 BCE and 200 CE. That's right. Most of the writings that make up the Book of Enoch are thought to have been written around 3,000 to 4,000 years after Enoch was alive. The Book of Enoch claims to be written by the biblical figure Enoch, but scholars believe it was actually composed by various authors over several centuries. So like The Lord of the Rings, much of what's in the Book of Enoch could be fictional rather than historically accurate. Another reason for its rejection was the inconsistencies found within the text, which undermined its authenticity and credibility. You can talk about the Bible however you like, but it's a well-put-together book from beginning to end. Every word seems to connect to another verse, forming a coherent story. In contrast, the Book of Enoch doesn't have that same level of organization. For example, throughout the Bible, Satan is seen as the main bad guy, but in the Book of Enoch, a demon named Azazel takes the blame for all the world's troubles. This difference makes the accuracy of the Book of Enoch questionable compared to the Bible. The Book of Enoch brings up some interesting points to think about. For example, it says that the fallen angels might have regretted their actions, but the Bible says they'll be punished forever. These differences, along with the fact that the book was written by different people, 
make it hard for scholars to figure out its real meaning. But one thing's for sure, the Book of Enoch gives us a peek into ancient times. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and want to dive deeper into topics like the Book of Enoch, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more discussions. Until next time, stay safe and we will be back with another one.